Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's my honor to present the next uh, speaker, David Ryan, three times US investing champion. Uh, we all know him as being featured in Market Wizards by Jack Schwager as well. Uh, David, thank you so much for being a part of this. And I'm really looking forward to this presentation, which is a little bit different than uh, some of the others that we've had uh, so far right. during this conference. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think. Uh... I, I don't know if anybody is uh, when they're entering or looking at the markets that there's ever a perspective that I'm bringing into it. But I, I think it's uh, it, at least for me, it, it really influences how I look at the markets, how I trade in the markets and 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 how I view my results in the market, too. So it's a it's a much, much different perspective. Some of this stuff might be very elementary for people who have been around for a long period of time, but at least might get you thinking of well, you know, what causes the markets to work and, and why do these stocks set up and such. So um, that's why I call this a different perspective in trading the markets. And I'm going to go into a number of different things. I'm going to talk just briefly different, uh, at differing worldviews. I'm going to look at uh, the symmetry, the repetitiveness, and even fractals. And I, I mentioned Fibonacci. I mean, there, there's so much math in, in, ingrained in the markets that you can see it. Uh, you can see how stocks react and so many different mathematical principles that are found there. But, but, and, and then I ask the question, well, is there order in the markets or there chaos? Well, Probably most of you wouldn't be trading the markets if you thought it was just chaotic and it was random and and you just had no edge in terms of uh, in helping to predict and 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 take positions that actually make you money. And then I'll get into there's nothing new under the sun, and this is uh, this is actually a quote from Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Um, that things just repeat themselves over and over and over again. And I'll show you some examples of of a stock from 1915 and and other stocks that have the similar characteristics that that the market that's there's really nothing new it's it's really identifying what has existed and and what has happened in the past and and you know O'Neill's uh, can slim is just based exactly on precedent of looking at the greatest winners of all time and so that's why i say there's just really nothing new under the sun and then how should we invest really looks at what should your attitude be towards the markets? What should your attitude uh, be in even just how you treat your results and such? So we'll go to that and then yeah, having, the right, having the right attitude. So let me give you just a little background so you know where I'm coming from or where I've been. I bought my first stock at age 13 and that's, and that's because my dad, who developed real estate, would come home and we'd sit around the dinner table and he would talk about, oh, I just I just bought um, I bought some stock in this in this new new concept in in, in food uh, and it's called Kentucky Fried Chicken. This is back in the mid to late 60s. Or he would talk about, you know, it, it, I bought some stock for you guys for your college education in Walt Disney and we used to watch the wonderful world of Disney during the 60s that would be on, you know, uh, on Sunday nights. Um, and so he would actually talk about these different things. And so I, for some reason, I started, I got interested, but uh, the first stock I bought was, uh, was a candy company uh, called Ward's Foods that I bought it at 10. I had 10 shares at 10 and a half. And in the next couple of years, I saw it drop all the way to two. And I start asking the question of, you know, why did my stock go down and I saw other stocks doing well? So I just became fascinated and actually started reading books. And I got a trial subscription to uh, Daily Graphs, which is the precursor to Market Smith from William O'Neill and Company. And after, after I, my first job was actually on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange as a runner. Uh, I was there for three months, but then I said, well, you know, it's got to be something a little bit better than just running tickets around the floor of the stock exchange. And so I had known of William O'Neill and company, and it wasn't that far from where I lived. And I walked right up the front stairs, asked for a part-time job, internship, anything. I'd work for free. And uh, a few minutes later, I was talking to William O'Neill's assistant. 
And then the next morning I had an interview with him and ended up staying there uh, for over 16 years. Um, and then in the 1980s, I, I started, yes, sir, I started in 1982. And then uh, I entered the US Investing Championships, uh, 85, 86, 87. I won all three of those years and got a lot of notoriety. Um, one thing kind of interesting in 1980, uh, 1988, I actually, I entered again and I actually was even for the year. I didn't, I didn't win the championships, but what the reason why that occurred is because I probably put too much pressure on myself on the results and wasn't really looking and, and enacting my discipline as I should have. So um, interesting point there. Then still working in a William O'Neill and company, they decided to start a mutual fund, which I ran for five years, called the New, U New USA Growth Fund, fund during the 1990s. Then 1998, I left William O'Neill and Company. I founded my own management company and uh, formed Rustic Rustic Partners, and uh, and uh, ran a hedge fund for 15 years. You can see the assets got as high as about 80 million. It was so it was a medium sized uh, uh, fund, but um, and really only had one direct employee uh, support staff. The hedge fund I ran was just very basic. I just bought stocks, sold stocks, shorted sometimes, options sometimes, not much, bonds rarely, but it was just really buying and selling stocks and it's very similar to what I do today. And right now, currently I trade my own account and I'm a consultant for Investors uh, Business Daily on IBD Live, I'm on Tuesdays and I help them out sometimes giving them some ideas of, of stocks they might wanna look at for their, their different services. So let me let's just let me start out um, a note from that um, approaching the market from a biblical perspective in no ways implies that if you believe or have faith in the God that you'll lead to greater performance. I, I don't want this to be a you know prosperity gospel type of thing uh, or you you name it you claim it. Uh, and so I'm presenting a perspective that gives you a different view on how to analyze the markets and how you can operate within them. And God didn't create the markets we trade in, but did create man with emotions that can cause the markets to move between extremes of fear and greed. And this human behavior can be tracked by distinct patterns that repeat and to me point to a designer behind it all. And then, and, and, you know, when Ray and Richard asked me to, to speak, I said, you know, I, I, would, I would like to speak, but I'd like to give this, this is a, uh, a presentation that I give at the Master's University, which is a Christian university out in Santa Clarita, California. They have about a thousand students and it's been around for, I, oh boy, I think it's uh, now like 70 years or so. Um, but I, it, I, I could have given you a presentation that just, just talked about the technical things I look at the market, but that would really be only half of my approach to the market because I come at it with a uh, sort of, I you call it a godly, a biblical perspective and in, in how the markets act and what I think about when I'm, when I'm trading in the marketplace. So, so I, I so this is kind of the complete approach. It, it gives you my sort of somewhat a technical view, and then also the, my thinking behind how I think the markets uh, are are acting. So here's different uh, differing worldviews, and this is not a place where we're going to get. I'm going to talk about you know the the differences and and the, the between creationism and and uh, and did. Uh, or, or is the world just by chance or here by God creating the earth and all that's in it? Uh, my perspective is that the God of the Bible is behind all of creation, the world around us, and everything that we find in the world points to harmony, design, purpose, and intelligence. And, um, and I'll show you some examples uh, of that. Um, and then here's a great passage. This is again from the Bible in the book of Romans. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. So if God created the entire world, shouldn't we also 
see that creation somewhat in the markets and how the markets act. So, and so, and, but in, in regardless of, of the stance that you take, if there's a God or no God or how the world was created and such, you, 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 I think we should all, we we all agree that there are, that the world operates to fix laws, laws of chemistry, physics, mathematics, gravity, uh, mass, et cetera, et cetera. And that, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to operate if there weren't laws. Uh, we wouldn't be able to sit in our chairs if there was no gravity. So there are, there are laws that, that, that really dictate how the world is, 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 uh, is moving and, and acting and how we act in it. So it's, it, to me, it's very important to recognize this order because we have, once you study the markets and identify the symmetry, the beauty of the patterns that a lot of these stocks take, that you can realize that the markets are not random and there you can there's a possibility to outperform and and you wouldn't be sitting here today if you didn't think you could outperform the market and and really do well in the markets and and help your economic uh, situation if if you didn't uh, believe that so there's a, a a symmetry and there's a repetitive in the market and and, I, and I'll go through this, and I've always said that, yeah, there's a distinct way that stocks act in an uptrend and a downtrend, and these re patterns repeat over and over again. And it, symmetry is just, is just I, I, my definition, it, it's the quality of being made up of exactly similar parts facing each other in or around an axis. And, and you'll find this when you see a cup and handle. Uh, you, you, a cup and handle should look like a cup and handle. It should be like, like O'Neill would always say, you know, when you reach up and, and you're about to make your coffee in the morning, you reach up and you get that cup and that, that cup and handle, the handle's in the right place. The cup's in the right place and the handle's not way down. If, if the candle, handle was too low or the side of the cup was misformed and all your, all your coffee would spill out. So there's a symmetry, a symmetry that, that, uh, that these things look and they've got there's actually a beauty to how some of these stocks actually set up and then there's fractals which is i i've i really never even heard of the concept of a fractal um until there i, I someone said that told me about this pbs special and i'll show you a little clip from this coming up um, but a fractal is it's this geometric figure which you find throughout nature which you actually see showing up in the markets. And as I said, it's a, each part has the same statistical characteristic uh, as the whole. And fractals can be seen as a pattern within a larger pattern or then someone else, uh, and I'll show you some examples of some other types of fractals people uh, have come up with. But, and then, uh, you know, I'm not even get into Fibonacci retracements, but boy, there's a lot of math. And I mean, so many different, uh, Computer programs uh, for trading the markets have, you know, where you can track Fibonacci retracements, and sometimes it's uncanny how sometimes, uh, you know, a 50% retracement or a 0.385 retracement actually is the spot where the stock stops or the index stops and starts moving uh, in the in the next direction in the other direction. Um, okay, so got that. So here's an example. I mean, it's here's symmetry and fractals all around us in within nature and some of the you know some of the mathematical principles just in how a shell is formed or a sunflower is made or there's fractals in trees and even in a fern the the one you know one little section of a fern ex is is an example of the entire fern itself so these things are all over nature all over where you see them and here is, and I hope this plays. Uh, there we go. Okay, this is a just. This is just a preview of a PBS special. I guess it was done all the way back in 2010. So this is 12 years old, and you'll you'll get this by when they show a cell phone. You'll see a cell phone that's like 12 years old, and it had, had re doesn't look anything like what we use today. But um, this talks about that the fractals in nature and how they're all around us and how fractals are, are the way you get computer graphics. Now, the movies we watch today wouldn't be the same if they didn't in, uh, find this 
years ago. So, and there's just two things I want you to, to key off of when they get to the, um, the man who really discovered this. Uh, I think his name is, his name is Mandelbrot. He said, I don't play with formulas. I play with pictures and I have my entire life. And that's almost exactly what I feel I've been doing for the last 40 years in the market. I've been playing. I've been looking at pictures. I look at pictures through charts all day long, and I'm looking for those next setups, those next setups, those those patterns that repeat over and over again. And that's sort of the same thing he said. And then there was there they had a scientist who said that these fractals were dis, were formed by natural selection over millions of years. And I disagree with that. I feel that there is a God who created this. But again, that's that's a, that's a time for another discussion. But hopefully this plays. Let's see. Here we go. Come on. On the frontiers of your medical research, in the news, and all over the world, wireless communications, one of nature's biggest design secrets has finally been revealed. My God, of course, it's obvious. It's an odd looking shape you may not have heard of, but it's everywhere on the news. The jagged, repeating foot. Called a They're all over in biology. There's solutions that natural selection has come up with over and over and over again. Fractals are in our lungs, and kidneys, and blood vessels. Flowers, plants, weather systems, the very essences of life. But it took a magnet mathematician to figure out how they work. I don't play with formulas, I play with pictures. And that is what I deserve of my life. It's this old challenge to centuries old assumptions about the various forms that nature takes. Sea forms that were always there, but formerly were invisible. Making the invisible visible. Finding order in disorder. What mysteries can it help us unlearn? Coming up next, on the hunting the hidden dimension. So, um, so any and so if you have a chance, it's on. It's you know you can find it on YouTube, and it's I think it's a I think it's an hour and a half. Or so and they get into I, I and I think it's fascinating because they go go into all these aspects of where fractals are found, and they even go into a jungle. And you, you think a jungle is just a, a a bunch of you know you know random plants growing all over the place, but they were able to actually go into a jungle and find those fractals within how the jungle is is developed and such. So and so you see this math and and I gave I kept on going back and and asking the question, well, shouldn't we see some of these things in in our in our own markets, in in the way you know stocks act? And here's here's a great whoops sorry. Here's a great example of that. Um, here's Microsoft. This is 1991, and 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 this uh, you know in January of 1991. And here's a nice big cup and handle forming, but then within the handle, there's another cup and handle that forms, and this doesn't happen all the, oops, this doesn't happen all the time, but it uh, but it 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 happens it it happens enough where you you see them showing up, and. Um, and so then the next the next example is Ollie's Bargain Outlet, which uh, is a recent example. This is just from uh, just a few days ago. And this is a stock that that I did actually uh, did well in years ago, which um, which I have actually come back to because they have a great growth story. Uh, they, they have 431 outlets right now. They're going to 750 over the next uh, five years. And they have a great concept. And But here's a cup and handle that was actually forming 
in the bottom. Now, cups and, cups and handles are usually best after an uptrend. But here's a cup and handle that, that formed in a bottom. And you can see I pointed out, Wayne, we'll get into this a little bit more. Yeah, there's some, some very big uh, volume characteristics that are showing up as the stock is moving higher. Anyway, you got a cup and handle going there. But then if I take it down into a 60-minute chart, you're seeing really this is the right side of the cup. I, I couldn't get it back going, but the, the, the whole cup started many days before it came down. And then you got uh, within the handle of that, you got another cup and handle and the stock started, started off from there and made, has, has made a, a, a terrific move. Now there's also, this is my son, Sean, who's, who's doing as, has done well over the years in the U S also in the U S investing championships. He said, dad, but there's, he sees fractals within, you know, patterns, you know, stocks that have taken patterns that then repeat themselves on, uh, again. And here's, oops, I'm sorry. Here's, here's Pharaoh. And this, you can see how this had really an example one, it had a top, it came down, it made one, two, three, four, four lower lows, and then turned and went higher. Then if you see an example two, it did the, exactly the same thing months, months ahead of time, and then repeated the whole thing over again before it went back up into another uptrend. And then here's another, this is Bitcoin in, in 2021, um, and it actually had you know a huge move up, but you can see the pattern where it made one, two, three, four highs, and then came down in three, one, two, three, and did the exact, almost the exact same thing of, you know, another, of, I think this is a few years, a few years later. So, um, so you're seeing a repeat again, and this is Nugget, uh, a, you know, a gold, uh, a gold ETF, similar type of thing where the stock made a great move up and then had three waves down, repeated the whole thing over again. So, so uh, yeah, one of these main points I like to make is that nothing new, there's nothing new in the market. These patterns repeat over and over again. In Jeffy, Jesse Livermore's book, you know, How to Trade in Stocks, which he wrote in 1940, he says right there, my theory and practical application have proved to my satisfaction that nothing new ever occurs in the business of speculation or investing in securities or commodities. And then you can go into the book of Ecclesiastes, which is in the Old Testament in the Bible, and Solomon says, you know, and this is written more than 2,000 years ago. I don't know, three or 4,000 years ago. He says, what has, been, has, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? Is there, it was here already long ago. It was, it was here before our time. And and nothing changes, even in the most successful stocks. They've had the same characteristics, and that's and that's what Can Slim is based on. It's based on the greatest winners of all time and the common characteristics that they have. That they had the same earnings. Yes, they had new products and different products, but it's that whole thing about it's you know a, a, a new method of doing something. But basically, it's, it's similar concepts. So. That repeats over and over again. And then pattern differences in uptrends and downtrends. And this is very, very basic, but I don't think people really key in off of this. And I know it's very simple. This is my stick figure picture that I drew. And But an uptrend versus a downtrend, the, an uptrend has the characteristics are 180 degrees different than a downtrend. Everything that happens in an uptrend is exactly the opposite of what, in, what happens in a downtrend. And you'll see when a stock, when a, when the stock, uh, a stock moves higher, it moves higher on higher volume. When it, it pulls back, it does it on lower volume. When it moves up again, the volume increases. When it goes sideways to down, it decreases. And this just continues on and on until the whole thing reverses. The stock starts down on big volume. It goes up on light volume. 
declines on big volume again and then repeats over and over again. And I know it's so basic, but if you can just identify the an uptrend versus a downtrend, you put your odds in the fa your favor of being on the right side of the market. And I, you know, I hate to say this is so simple, but the things I use in the market are very, very simple. I don't get into too many, you know, too many indicators. I just have a few basic indicators. A lot of them, if I was going to cut everything down, it would really say, you know, if I could add two things, it would just be the price and the volume, eliminate everything else. And I could probably do, uh, I do, do fine in the market. And here's a, here's a, an example. I, I, I wrote down these characteristics just so you can see the left side is the uptrend. The right side is the downtrend. You know, an up day, you have higher volume, down day, lower volume. And just, it's just the opposite on the downtrend. And then it, moving averages. Moving averages are in an uptrend, and the price is above the moving average. Gaps occurring to the upside. Relative strength line in an uptrend. Group strength strong and other stocks confirm. Those are just basic principles that repeat over and over again and it's 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 so interesting you know in a market like this when we're we have there's so few stocks that are in nice uptrends people are still going well do i buy this stock when it's down 50 percent or 60 percent and said it, it doesn't have the characteristics that put the odds in your favor of making money in the market so now here's an example of zoom video and you'll see the you'll see the different lines i draw this uptrends when a stock is in an uptrend and then it consolidates it just drifts out it sorry it drifts sorry it just drifts it, it, it drifts sideways and then when the stock moves up and goes sideways again you can see this over and over again but then when you get to the high at five five eighty eight the whole picture starts changing what happens is you start getting wedges to the right <clears throat> you get you get uptrends that are weaker and they're rallying on weaker volume and lighter volume. You'll also see the volume spikes and the, and the gaps start occurring to the, uh, you know, to, the, to the downside, huge gaps in volume. I always key off of uh, volume spikes is when you get the biggest volume spike that has been, uh, has been traded on the downside. To me, that's a big warning sign. And when you start seeing that show up, then it's then it's time for uh, you know the market probably going in the wrong in, in the different direction. See, and then and the stock has a you know it, it has a decent rally in here, but as you start getting towards the end of the rally, volume starts weakening. Here's another. I mean, the stock rallied from three to four hundred, but check out the volume and that red line below my black bar is just showing you. Look at the average daily volume has really dropped off much much different than when the stock was in an uptrend the stock had rising average daily volume for most of the move and there were still big volume spikes coming in now the thing has really started changing and changing its characteristics here's another this is a little bit longer in the move you see the same thing happening weak rallies on light volume big gaps in price and then the thing just comes all the way down and even recently i could have driven uh, drawn this in but even you had another weak rally at from 102 across you can just draw those trends and the stock is is still in a downtrend so as i already mentioned can slim um you know the, the stocks are can slim is entirely based on past precedent and here's a quote that i just took out of o'neill's um, book there's an enormous amount uh, that, you, that you will learn from studying these great historical examples. You'll see chart patterns that are repeated year after year with huge success. From these observations, you'll be able to recognize the types of price and earnings powers these stocks develop just before their spectacular price advances. So what you can do, and I always recommend this, is just always every year go back and study the biggest winners. Ch look at the different characteristics they've had and memorize those, get those ingrained into your mind so you can recognize them when they come again. Now, here's some examples of, of great winning stocks. And, and, th and these are all from the technical side. I'm not even gonna go into Can Slim. You can, you can get O'Neill's book and really get the details about this. But here's Bethlehem Steel on a weekly basis that, um, that is uh, back from 1915. 
the I guess there was no trading during World War One for about an eight month uh, for at least a number of months or yeah, for a number of months. But then when it started trading again, the stock started breaking out, actually formed uh, a new base. And and you can actually if you look to the bottom of the chart, you'll see how the volume was drying up as the stock was 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 consolidating. And then the huge volume spike as the stock started up again, came up, built another base. Volume started to, started to come off. You got a few a few weeks that were down, but it didn't it didn't continue. And then the base built again and then took off and made another move. There was a climactic top, but then the stock actually based again and had had one more move. Very similar to this is Monster Beverage. This is um, also a weekly chart. This is going back to September of 03. I drew in the lines again. The different consolidations that occurred was was on lighter volume, but every time the stock moved higher, it was on big big volume, and. Um, and so, and it, you know, long basing pattern, there was really no volume as the stock was basing, but you can see, I'm always comparing the volume that was happening one week or one day with the previous to see what the comparison is. Here's Monster Beverage, this is a daily look and you can see the similar, similar different pattern showing up over and over again. Here's Franklin Resources. Now Franklin is a stock that I actually, uh, uh, I did very well, and this is one of the stocks I had in U.S. Investing Championships. This is one um, we used in a, a seminar I did for uh, for uh, Investors Business Daily, and you can see my buy spots coming out of out of long bases, and you can see how the volume dried up. and And if you look to the right, you'll be amazed. And I I can't even remember that it's that this small. Look at the volume that was actually trading during the mid 80s on some of these great winning stocks. You know, the, their average daily volume at one point when I was first buying the stock was 25,000 shares. That was a big day. But it, the interesting thing, some people say, well, you know, I never buy stocks that are so, you know, that that don't have a certain amount of volume. But sometimes the biggest winners start out fairly small. You know, in these days they start out fairly fairly small, and they're maybe trading a few hundred thousand shares. But by the end of the move, a lot of these great winners are trading millions of shares. So, because if you if you also look at Franklin's resources and the move that this thing made over the years, the volume just kept on increasing, increasing. But similar, you know, again, similar process, uh, principles, and even the four stages. And this is something that you know. That Stan Weinstein's talked about, Mark Minervini's talked about, and very basic, but these four stages of a market leader repeats itself over and over again. This this is Generac, which had a great move. And you can see number one is the base period, number two is the uptrend, number three is the top, and number four is uh, is the downtrend. And so if you can recognize these different patterns that repeat over and over, son. It's you know you can get your, you know get onto the right side of the market. And when it comes down to it, ad identifying the leadership in the market or identifying if we're in an uptrend or a downtrend is not that hard. But the hard part comes is when it comes down to you enacting this and being swayed by your emotions, going from fear to greed. And so. Um, well, I'll get into that in just a minute. But here's here's one more. Here's Ollie's bargain again. I want to show this. It's showing this is the four stages of a base, or four stages of a of a of a move. I highlighted all those huge volume spikes as the stock was building the base. In most cases, you can find that the stock, you know, the stock is setting up, and you'll see these characteristics set up before the stock actually makes a move. And then I actually, you know, in my very basic uh, drawing there, there's a cup and handle within the handle. So you got a bigger cup and handle, then a smaller cup of handle forms, and then the stock just takes off and, and breaks out. And here's the move. Here's the up move, the stage two. Very same thing. I mean, I hate to be repetitive, but it's, it's, it's the market. It's very, very repetitive. Volume spikes occurring to the upside as the stock's moving out. But then as you start getting towards the top, things start changing and you'll start seeing on the right side of this chart. Look, look at how the, 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 
the red spikes actually start start dominating. You actually you even had a, a climactic move here when the stock went from the mid 70s up to the 90s. And it actually did it on some lighter volume. It really, I guess you got a, a few good days there, but as you started getting to the top, the whole pictures just starts changing. And if you, if you can just identify colors, you're, you'll be on the right side of the market. Then here's, here's the downtrend and see the whole picture changes. Look at that 6.4 million shares traded to the downside, a huge, huge volume and you can this even gapped before the the uh, the high you can uh, the the stock back in december before that 5.4 million shares traded the down so side it came back for one more little move but it really didn't have didn't have much left and then the whole thing started down so gaps in price huge volume spikes weak rallies on lower on lower volume so then okay so we've it's so you got this repetitive, you got this, that the market is, is really the same over and over again. And it's just identifying what side of the market that you're on, but then comes down to where you are and what your approach is to the market. So, and this is the attitude that I have, and this is, and this is really the right key. We're not to love money. And then in, in, in the Bible, again, 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I've seen in 40 years some real tragedies in the marketplace where people were, were money, success, and, 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 and their results become so big that it really hurts other areas of their life, their relationships with their families, with their wives, with their friends. And this is something that is so important that you have to step away. The markets will always be there, but, but you're, <laughs> you know, if, if you're spending so much time at this or you're putting so much emphasis on this, then other things can, uh, can, can falter. And then Ecclesiastes, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And so you could just keep on going, well, I got to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's, you have to have the right attitude in the markets. When I, I saw just a, a few brief minutes of the previous present, uh, uh, presentation on, on psychology in the market, and when I really do the best is when I never look at my bottom line and I'm not looking at how much I made, uh, you know, how much I'm up for the day or down for the day and looking at the P&L. When I first started, you had to call your broker uh, to get exactly what, where you were in the market. And I would really actually check only once a month at the end of the month to see where my where my profit and loss was, where my account equity was. And what that did, it, it, it helped me to really focus on just executing what I should be doing, following the rules that have been laid down and, um, and getting off you know, how much I'm up, because that can influence you. That can bring in emotion, emotion that is not good in your investment decisions. So how should you invest? Okay, use a method that works. Um, it's, you know, it, this first passage is, you know, the way of a fool. This is in Proverbs and, and Proverbs has, has got so much wisdom in it, but the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who's listened to the counsel. And I commend everybody who's watching and is listening to these other presenters because I, you know, I assume most of these have done very, very well in the market and they're coming out at you with rules and principles that you can use within the marketplace. So I think that's, you know, you're off to a great start, but then you have to have discipline. And no matter if you use can slim or you're a value investor or you're purely technical or you're a day trader, you have to have discipline. Psalm, Psalms 523, he'll die for the lack of discipline, led, a grave, led astray by his own great folly. If you're not following rules and if you're not disciplined, then boy, you can get off on the wrong track and lose a lot of money very, very quickly. And what discipline does, it takes out your fear, Matthew 6, 27, and, uh, and who of you by worried can add a single hour to his life and greed 
as I, we already said, I already went over this, who loves money, never has enough. And then pride, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And this is something I learned long ago that I, if someone asked me, how are you doing in the market? Or, you know, ten, and, and, you know, hey, have you had any big winners? I, I, I usually just say, you know, I'm doing fine. Because anytime I start talking about this great stock that I had and how much money I've made and how well I've done, man, it's just like the next day, the stock blows up for some reason. Earnings come out or it just starts down. And that's why I just, you know, just try to never talk about performance and let other people talk about your performance. So anyway, pride, be very, very careful in that situation. So the battle is really against yourself. And as I said you know, before, there's nothing new in the, uh, under the sun. All this is laid out for you on the internet and books. I mean, O'Neill's book has got, uh, has got a, uh, is really one of I, only a few books that I recommend. But when I was starting the 1982, and I joined a William O'Neill and company, he actually, he wasn't doing any seminars. He wasn't laying all this out. He hadn't really developed Can Slim. Every once in a while, he would talk to people. He would give an in-house uh, seminar for people for an hour and kind of go over the market. But uh, it was really up to uh, up to yourself to to really look at examples from the past and learn from those. But now, I mean, you've got so much stuff out there. I mean, you, you could spend a year going through everything that's out of there on CanSlim and, and other things. But, but once you put in enough time to learn the repetitive markets and the, the, the symmetry of the markets, you can improve your performance. But remember, it's, yeah, it's a battle again of you against you and controlling your fear and discipline in the market. Jesse Livermore, here's another quote. How to trade in stocks. Let me say again, the human side of every person is the greatest enemy of the average investor or speculator. So there's a lot of great human wisdom out there on the markets, too. And so I, I would like to mix that in. Um, and, but keep the right perspective. You know, command those who are rich. This is from First Timothy. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our uh, enjoyment. And this, I, I love this passage too, Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Or you can rephrase that and say, my mind and you know, my ability has found these great stocks and I've produced all this wealth by investing in the markets. But remember, it's the Lord your God for it's he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms in its covenant, which he swore to you and your ancestors as it is today. And then the last thing, and a lot of people might go, whoa, this is, this is really way out there. But if you look at Psalms, God really owns everything. I mean, if this, you know, this is what I believe. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in, my, in, uh, in the field is mine. And so we, with that, we must be good stewards of what God has entrusted us. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches to you? And last thoughts. With the mindset of uh, that there's an order, a symmetry, a symmetry repetitiveness in the market, so, you know, study the past to know how stocks and the markets move. Combine that with the right attitude and perspective. Be thankful for whatever the results you have in the market. And this is so great importance. One must perceive each day of existence, labor and basic provision as a gift from God and accept whatever God gives. Uh, and then lastly, recommended books, how to make money in stocks. Probably a lot of you have that, William O'Neill. How to Trade in Stocks by Jesse Livermore, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market by Nicholas Darvis, which is a great, written in the 1960s. And then I have a book, of, if you have questions about faith, the Bible and such, Reasons to Believe by Nathan Busnitz uh, has a, a lot of great uh, uh, talk about why, why believe. And then also the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of you probably have it sitting on your shelf gathering dust, but there's so much wisdom about about the markets, about life, about you know our future, life and death and such, highly recommend 
you taking that out and start uh, and and start cracking that open. So, with that, I guess we can get to some questions, and I we can get into the current market and and anything they they've got on their minds. Perfect, uh, David. Thank you so much for this presentation. Really giving uh, insight into you know your motivations for trading and 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 how you view the world in general. So thank you so much for that. Um, and we've got plenty of questions coming in that are really excellent. Uh, but first, why don't we just uh, hop over to Marcus Smith, David, and I'll switch back to the other sc the other screen just in case. And we'll be right right back, everybody, and uh, cover the market. All right, welcome back, everybody. We'll go ahead and take a ton of questions, keep them coming in the chat. We've seen some amazing ones. Uh, to kick things off, uh, though, David, I just kind of want to set the scene here, um, and I, I'd love to hear your take on on you know the current bear market that we're experiencing and and how you've dealt with it. Um, we last talked and did an interview uh, back in fall of, of 2021, and I, I think you had some caution, um, cautionary words back then. So I'd love to hear, you know, how you've dealt with it and what were the signs that you were noticing that we could potentially be entering a correction. Obviously, we never know how bad it's going to get, uh, but what, what were the signs that you were kind of looking at? Well, the the, the signs were uh, a lot of a, a lot of great stocks actually topped back in February of last year, and a, a lot of growth stocks did. Uh, but the market, there was so much money in the market, and the government was dishing out so much money that uh, that it just kept on rotating into other other groups. And then, with there's with so much money in the economy, prices started moving up. So commodities started moving up. Oil and gas started moving. Up. So, so a lot of growth ended in in February of last year. I mean, if you uh, just looking at um, just looking, you know, at Zoom video on that we're using, you know, this was actually this was actually in the fall of of 2020, yeah. long long before the market was topping out. Uh, but a lot of other things started topping in in February. Here's Shopify. Well, this well, I guess Shopify actually went a little bit. It it, it went until uh, you know November December, but really. You didn't make much progress from from the high in in February of 21. So I saw that going on, and we kept on rotating into different groups, and all the cyclicals were moving, and fertilizer stocks were still in a great uptrend up until March of this year. Um, but then you did get the the indexes starting the to to top out in in January and February. So here's here's really the beginning of the year. And, uh, you know, then, then, I mean, you can, st you can start seeing, look at the volume starting to pick up on the downside, how many days in a row you had as the market was topping. Look at all these volume spikes are coming in on the, on the downside up in here. And then you start breaking moving averages. And look, and the, the rally started getting lighter on lighter volume. Every time you rallied, even, even through this great rally, from 420 to 460, which lasted only three weeks, the volume, you had one day above average daily volume. And then the volume started picking up again onto the, onto the downside and you got huge spikes down. And so this, this, you're really in a series of, it's a downtrend where you get two to three week rallies and the rallies come on, on weak volume. Even yesterday, you look at you look at the spiders, it had a great day, but the volume wasn't even bigger. It, I mean, yesterday was kind of a, sorry, Thursday was a stalling day, but yesterday you, you still had lighter volume. Now you can probably, you can play these ra rallies if, if depending on your time frame, if you have a very short term frame, you could try to play these rallies, but I'm, and, and, and I actually started buying a few things down here for just a trade that maybe will last a few days into the 50 day moving average, or maybe it goes a little bit longer because so many people are, are negative. But you, in, until these moving averages start trending back up, you have to treat everything with a, a real, a, a lot of caution. Perfect. And there's a great question here from Roy. Um, asking about your experience as a hedge fund manager. So, uh, David, when you ran the hedge fund for 15 years, uh, did you ever go through periods where you were 100% in cash during bear markets, uh, for instance, in 2000, 2002, and 2007, 2009? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, because when I ran my hedge fund, if you, uh, if, we, if you look at the monthly, I'll show you where I started. I actually, I think I started in, this is a monthly, and so I started right here. 
Markets sold off into the fall and then it had a, one final move up into a high, but then corrected 50% and another 50% twice while I was running the hedge fund. I, I ran it until about this period, 2014, but I went through two 50% corrections, but I lost very, very little because I went to cash. And that's so much great about operating with a discipline is if the, the discipline should get you in as the market is turning and stocks are starting to show up with the right characteristics, and it should also get you out when the market is rolling over and there's nothing left to buy. And so during these periods, I went to, I was 90% cash, maybe 95% cash. I had very, very little in the marketplace. And my, my clients loved me because they would see, I think in, in 2000 and I maybe it was 2007, 2008, I think I might've been down like five or 6% for the year while they look at their other portfolios and they're down 30 or 40%. Uh, but I see no reason I, there's, I mean, there, there are times where you should be a hundred percent out of the market on I, IBD live. I said, you know, especially for people who are new to this, this is a great time to study and to just sit on your hands because the opportunities are so small, your chances of, of making a, money, making a lot of progress are very, very small. Perfect. And David, I know you said you keep things really simple and just look pretty much at the market and leading stocks. But do you look at any kind of indicators like the advanced decline line that gives you a sense of, you know, the market breadth or, or you know, the percentage of stocks above the 200 day moving average, stuff like that? Or it's really just the indexes and the individual stocks? themselves? Yeah, I, I, I look at indicators. I've got I've got some indicators that I, I look at. Um, on stock share. I've been actually keeping the McClellan oscillator. Well, I actually don't do it by hand, but I used to do it by hand. The McClellan oscillator and summation index, which really is just a moving average on advances versus declines. Right. And um, I've been watching that since the early eighties. And, um, and I, I look at that, but a lot of it, it's, those are all, a lot of those are just kind of secondary uh, secondary indicators where, yes, I, I put value into it, but most of what I get is just looking at price and volume on the indexes and the individual stocks. Perfect. And uh, I know your a lot of your presentation was about how the same patterns repeat themselves and things are never really change, but has, has kind of the pace of things in the market gotten a little bit faster over the years. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, maybe, maybe the, the, the intraday moves are faster, but it seems like if you step back, the, the, the move still, you know, a, a stock usually has a nice move over a year and a half to two years. Um, bull markets last longer, you know, let's say two or three years before, before you get a major correction. They, 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 I, I would see maybe just more the intraday movements are faster than, uh, than they have been in the, in the past. And, and maybe that maybe that's because also a lot of stocks trade at much higher prices than they they did in the past. In the 80s and 90s, there was very few stocks that traded uh, above $100 a share. Most everything was below that, and most stocks split when they got too high. Now, very few stocks split. I mean, I guess more have been recently, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I think the the movement, at least maybe on a price basis, is, is a little faster intraday, but not not overall. Perfect. And there was a question I can't find exactly who asked it, but it was basically: uh, Have you noticed any kind of differences in the success rate in buying breakouts? Um, you know, now versus back in the past, back in the eighties, nineties, um, or is it really about you know there's a right time, a right environment to be buying breakouts? And a lot of the times, you know, when we're in a correction like this, they're not going to have, you know, great success rates. Yeah. in in a market like this, I mean, uh, the amount of stocks that break out and, and have a great move are very, very small. I mean, and in a market like this, if you're going to trade them, it's much better to be buying weakness as it's starting to turn than it is to buy a strength of a stock that has already come up, you know, is already up 20% from its low and now breaking out. Um, but yeah, no, they, they, they'll they work a lot better when you're in an uptrend. And in, when when things start turning, you, a lot more will start breaking out and going. But this is, 
this is not that environment right now. And, and we might be in this environment for, for a, a while longer until inflation cools off and, and rates have, have gone up. Um, yeah, and then one other thing on indicators and stuff, I, I, I know a lot of people, they look for the follow through day, the follow through day, follow through day uh, that O'Neill has written about. And when you get in a market like this, a lot of those follow day, through days don't work. And I don't put that much, I, I, I say, you know, I, I look at the follow through day, but I put so much emphasis on, can I find the individual stocks to buy? And if I see the market following through, but I, I look around and there are no setups, then I go, how far is this really going to go if I can't find individual stocks? So uh, you have to combine the two and get the whole picture of what's, what's happening. Perfect. And I want to ask you about your process and routines for, for tracking rotation and identifying the groups that are seeing accumulation, that are that are seeing an influx of capital from institutions, because you seem to have a great pulse on that um, transitioning, you know, to fertilizers, more cyclical names uh, last fall, and also, um, you know, paying attention to when the growth stocks were really uh, falling out of favor. So I'd love to hear your process. Uh, do you run any screens? What's kind of your ways to identify which groups are, are leading at the current moment? Um, well, using using MarketSmith, I I look at um, where's uh, here's industry groups. I look at this every week, and I I you know I just I sort them by um, you know by the rank for the industry group rank for this week, um, and I actually and yeah, you'll, you'll see a number of oil and gas groups, but those are actually starting to slip back. Yeah. It used to be entirely oil and gas, but now those are starting to underperform because prices come down. But I actually, I actually go through them one by one, and I do it on an iPad. I don't have my iPad in front of me, but I can go through a lot of a lot more stocks because I can get four pictures on my iPad, uh, and I can look at four groups and just quickly go through. And I I go through at least the the first 100 groups in the market to see what's uh, what's out, what's performing. I also look at their group ranks and see, oh, here's um, medical biomed that that has actually come up um, from group 29 to group nine in the last few weeks. So yeah. maybe biotechs are starting to to uh, to turn and then it's breaking a downtrend, which it's been in for a couple of years now. So I. So I, I look at that. I also look, uh, here's Minervini uh, tr uh, market trend one month. This just shows me stocks that are starting to turn. These are stocks, I guess it, it's, it's showing the 200 day moving average that's turning up for the first time in, in a long time. And when I start seeing new groups and new stocks form, you know, showing up here, then, uh, then that gives me an indication, oh, hey, maybe that group is turning. Now, here's one grocery outlet that has had a nice move. This is more defensive. I really can't find any other stocks in the group that are doing well with this. But, um, but it, this gives me an idea. And then I go through, I have, you know, Market Smith 250. I go through lots of screens. Um, I always arrange this Market Smith 250 in terms of group rank because I want to see the strongest stocks in the market with the strongest groups. And so I see what's, what's showing up here. So you go through a number of screens and these are you know, very basic screens. They're nothing, they're nothing, you know, that, but you have to go through lots and lots of stocks. I try to go through hundreds, if not, you know, sometimes I've gone through all 2000 stocks in the, in the O'Neill database or that's on MarketSmith. Uh, but I try to go through hundreds and hundreds to give me a good feel of what ha what's happening in the market. Perfect. And getting back to your background a little bit, I'd love to hear about some of the key turning points that you felt um, have happened uh, during your career as a trader. What were some moments where there's kind of an aha moment where, wow, I really should do this, and that really changed your performance and improved it dramatically? Well, this, uh, this goes all the way back to 1983, 84. You know, I joined O'Neill and, and the bull market started in August of 1982 and, um, and I really didn't know what I was doing, but I doubled my account, but I wasn't operating with the right rules and principles and stuff. So 
my account went from like $30,000 to $60,000. I lost it all back and I went into the teens. So finally, one weekend, I sat down and I said, what in the world am I doing? And I looked at every single stock that I bought. I put in the buy point. I, and this is when we had printed charts. I'd tear them out. I'd mark up where I bought it, where I sold it. And I started seeing a pattern develop over and over again that I was doing the same thing. I was buying extended stocks. I wasn't buying exactly at the buy point. And from that point on, I said, OK, I don't care what anything else looks like. I am looking for this one setup. I'm looking for you know, a cup and handle, a flat base, and I'm buying it exactly where I should buy it. And if it gets too extended and I missed it, I missed it. And that was the point where, bang, I hit one stock and it clicked. And then I hit another one and then another one. And it was just one after another of great winning stocks. Franklin Resources was one of the ones that I looked at. Um, but yeah, one, one thing that I, I would like to mention is that going back to patterns and such, you know, so many people, they, they, you know, they read O'Neill's book and they think they have to find cups and handles. And I've, I've finally got to the point where I got so, uh, I got, I got so, I don't know, I'm not upset with the questions that people had, oh, where's the cup and handle or where's this W pattern and where's this, I just, I, maybe I termed the phrase, I just said, just draw the line. Because when a base is built, you, really the most critical point is where the stock is coming out of the base. So if I draw this line on Lily, here's, here's all this stuff that's going on. And now yeah, maybe you can see, I guess they draw in a cup and handle, but all the, you can almost forget what is occurring below here. Yes, I want, I want to look at it and see if I'm starting to see volume pick up on the upside and, and multiple days, but don't make the market so complicated just I, as as that uh, mathematician said, I look at pictures all day and I draw lines. And I, I don't. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's not that complicated. And it's being very disciplined in 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 buying the right setup. So uh, draw the line, study the patterns, and uh, you'll probably do a lot better in the marketplace. Perfect. And. As you're looking at charts, are you always are you always looking to buy out of kind of a tight area area right right under that line that you drew previously? There was a nice kind of you know handle type consolidation within that overall base. So is that always what you're trying to do? Buy up the right hand side, um, right near basically that line um, from basically moving out of a contraction. Yeah. Yes, and that's when I'm going through hundreds of start uh, charts. I'm not looking. I'm I'm usually very very quickly. I'm looking at at the uptrend, and then I'm keying off what is happening in these last, you know, six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Is the stock tightening up? You know, it, how's it acting? Is there a, a nice tight, you know, tight spot in there? But yes, I they, when a stock calms down and tightens up especially as you're close to the highs that's your that's your best setup now there are lower setups and um you know mark minervini talks about low cheats and medium cheats and high cheats the lower you get in the base the uh the to me your risk starts going up because lots of times they can come out of a lower cheat then move up and then roll over so you have to be you have to be careful if you concentrate on just the ones that are up near the top of their patterns then you're you'll probably be uh, probably do a lot better and when you're buying from that contraction where are you usually placing your stop loss is it at the low of that tight area or is it at the low of the breakout low of that week how do you like how do you usually do it well that's the, the best thing about a tight pattern is that you, is that when you have a nice tight pattern, you can set it below uh, the, 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 the low of that pattern. And usually that's not, that's not even close to 8%. It's usually like three or 4%. And so that's what's great about buying off a very tight formation is that, um, is that you can limit your risk. And you know the whole thing. I mean, we didn't even get into risk management and cutting your losses. But uh, but you know, every time I'm buying, I, I do not want any any loss to go above you know eight percent. And uh, most of my losses are much smaller than that. If I have 
if I have one fault, I probably take my losses too quickly and I get out of a stock and then it sits there and turns and then takes off and goes without me. Um, but then once the stock makes a move, then I use moving averages or I just watch the stock and how it's acting and uh, you know look for trend lines. So you know maybe after the stock breaks out, makes this move and starts you know breaking this trend line, or breaking some moving averages, then I might cut back on the on the stock or sell it out, uh, outright. Perfect. And um, there's a question going back to uh, when you competed in the championship. Uh, let me bring it up here. Uh, so it's from Elizabeth. A question for David. How did you overcome the pressure from focusing on the competition results and shifting to focus on the rules and process? Thank you. Well, that's, yeah, and I, I mentioned that earlier. It's best not actually to even look at your... <laughs> your 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 equity and your account and how it's moving every day is is just looking is just concentrating on the rules that you enact and if you enact rules that have proven successful in the past uh you should do you should do very very well i mean it's it's like i told you i said in the fourth year that the, those championships i was so concentrated on performance and 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 how I had to win again, that I lost sight of the rules, and I started doing things differently. I started taking two big big positions and not starting out at five percent and then moving up. Um, you know, and, and so I started doing things differently. I started breaking the rules. So it's it's trying to just get you know. Don't look at your equity. Don't look at your profit and loss all the time, but just enact the rules day in and day out. And and that and the equity is going to take care of itself if if you're doing if you're enacting the rules correctly. Perfect. And going back to that post analysis you did that that really gave you some perspective. I love to hear your advice for traders out there who are doing post analysis. What should they look for? How should they mark up their charts? And and what should what, how can they find those ultimate takeaways that can really change your performance? Yeah, well, what you can do now, I mean, say you can either print the chart out, which uh, you can do, and then write all the reasons why you're 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 buying the stock at that point. Also, circling the different characteristics that you're looking for, um, different indicators you're looking for on the chart. You can do that, and then then you know put it into the book, or you can screenshot it, and then and then mark it up, and then you know put that into a file. And then after you after you sell it, then also print out a chart or screenshot a chart of the the, the move that 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 made. And then you go back and you study. Okay, well, did I make money in this? Did I lose money? Uh, and and jot down maybe the reasons of. Oh, it's it's amazing how you can go back months later and look at a stock and go, I can't even believe I bought that stock. What was I thinking? And so, and then lots of times patterns will start developing of, of the same thing you're doing over and over again, which is wrong and why you're losing money. So that, that's why it's as, you know, almost more important to study your losers than it is to study your, your winners because it's actually painful, but you have to go through that. You have to, or have somebody do it for you and be able to have, uh, you know, you know a, an ego that's small enough that somebody can actually tell you, hey, you might be doing something wrong here, right. but most people don't want, you know, want to do that. Perfect. And there's a question here from John. Uh, William O'Neill used the weekly charts more than daily. Uh, which do you look at most? And I'd also love to hear uh, along with that, um, if you go into any intraday timeframes, you know, at those buy points or it's really sticking to weekly and daily charts. I, you know, I usually, I usually look at dailies, but I am going, I'm looking at every single time frame. Uh, you know, first I might find it on the daily or I might find it on the weekly. Um, but then, you know, so I go from daily to weekly and I look at the big picture, but then I even go to monthly and see, this is, you know, I love these setups. Look at that. That's a gigantic cup and handle. I mean, that, that, that was, that was, you know, 20 years, almost 20 years in the making, but boy, did that look good. And look at the move that you've gotten off of that. Um, same thing here, Generac. Look at it. Here's a look at this beautiful, nice five year base. And then look at the move that stock has made. So, but then, okay, so then you get it down to the buy point. And so then I, I go all the way down 
So I go down to the daily, but then I might even look, I actually might look at the 60 minute just to get even more granular, the, the exact buy point <clears throat> down to the, you know, the, down to the penny or so. And on this time frame, are you looking to see volume really coming in or it's really about price action more than volume as it's pushing through a pivot? Uh, well, you, you want to see, you want to see the volume, but, um, but if a pattern is, is set up, you know, exactly right. It's a, and again, it's, it has a, a, a symmetry to it. Um, and it, it's set up right and the volume's not there. I'll go ahead and I'll start a position anyway. Uh, because lots of times the volume comes in the next day or later in the day, but I might start the position because what can happen is that it's at the perfect buy point, but yes, you're not seeing your 200% increase in volume, but it's, you know, the volume's up 25%. Well, it may be just be that people haven't seen it yet or recognized it, or it hasn't hit the different alert alerts that people have. Then the volume starts coming in. And if you wait, sometimes you can get off to a late start. Perfect. And I wanted to ask you about um, how you consider overhead supply when you're making a buy decision. Uh, how important is it for you uh, for that you know proper base to be close to 52 week highs, or even do you prefer all time highs, um, you know, as close to that all time high level as possible? Yeah. Well, I, I uh, the, the 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 longer the high, the better. Uh, but if I mean, if you have a situation where the stock uh, I mean, well, here's an example, the triple Qs. I mean, now when you take a look at this, you now have, how many months is that? How many quarters? One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so you have seven quarters. You have a, over a year and a half of overhead supply. That's why I think this is going to take a longer time to, to work itself out. Even if we don't go lower, maybe we do go lower. But what we're probably going to have to do is spend more time building a longer base. And so what that what that then does, and maybe uh, uh, if I can go to the a monthly, uh, well, let me let's let me let me bring up the spies on the on the monthly. See, you, we might be coming down, but we're going to have to ra start rounding out and start breaking some some downtrend. And, and the farther you get away from that overhead, and I'm saying, I think you want to get at least a year away from that overhead um, and, and, and actually give it some time and see it, let it burn through it and see if it can get through it. So you're, and, and I think Mark Minervini has said this, you're, 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 the ultimate is not to buy the bottom, it is to buy when your risk is lowest and when you have the greatest probability of, of, of you making money in the market. So yes, you might have to give up some on the upside, but it will tell you that the market is strong enough to get through some of that overhead, or you've given it long enough time for that overhead to kind of just fade away because people usually after, as time goes on, either you know sell out or they give up or, or they're just never going to sell. Perfect. And how important was that for O'Neill as well to buy, you know, near all-time highs versus uh, 52 week highs? Which, which would he prefer? And is he always looking to buy near near that high level? Well, and I, I think on individual stocks, he's definitely looking at at 52 week highs. But on the overall market, he's looking more for a follow through day, which could occur, you know, down here. But that's why I say you have to combine it with the individual stocks because if you don't have individual stocks to find, to buy, they're not major stocks. They're not leaders that are moving the indexes. The rally's not going to go that far. So you, you have to combine it with the two. And if you are going into a favorable market, you should have a number of stocks to buy. And usually they're the stocks where you're going, what in the world is that? I've never seen that name before. Why is that leading right now? You, you really haven't gotten that yet. Perfect. And there's a pretty good question here that I'll bring up. Uh, David, what would you do if you're not a full-time trader uh, to be able to transition successfully from you know working a career and trading part-time uh, into a successful cancel trader? Any advice or steps to make during this transition? Uh, well, I, 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 I would think you would have to have, before you make that transition, don't give up your day job. Uh, 
make sure you've had success and you've had success over not just the the since March of 2020. There are a lot of people that had a lot of success, but then there are a lot of people that are now giving a lot of it back. Um, I would say you should have success over a number of years if you're going to do this part time and you have to uh, and you and this is what's going to support you and you and possibly your family. Um, if, if you are going to go into full time trading and you've got enough of a nest egg to rely on, then I would start slowly. I would start with a smaller percentage of your money. I wouldn't just go in with everything you've got, especially in this market. I would start slowly. And then as you've had success over the months and over the years, then you continue to add add money to it. I think too many t people start out with with, you know, they want to be fully invested right away. But especially if you're starting out and a lot of this is new to you, you take 90 percent of your money and put it in an interest bearing account or some, you know, inflation protected bond and you use 10 percent and trade with that. Perfect. And um, there's a question here uh, also going back to, you know, that 1980, 1990 period when you're in the championship. Um, great insights and wisdom, David Ryan. If you look back to your 1980 to 1990s, what is one thing you would like to do differently? Also, what is one aspect of um, trading that you are proud of? Uh, let's see. Uh, one thing I would do differently. Well, it, you know, it, uh, hindsight is always 2020, and there were probably a lot of there's a lot of stocks that I got pieces of moves on. You know, I got like a 40, 50 percent move and then I moved to another one. But then I came back to the other one. Some of them I would like to have held longer. And it's it's yes, it is so easy when you look back and said, oh, yeah, I, I should have held that for two years. I should never have sold that stock. So I like to I you know, I, I actually I, I don't I, I don't day trade. I look more swing trade. But I like to hold things for a long period of time. I like to find companies that have concepts uh and, and that are going to be lasting and, and you know concepts and earnings and all the characters they're going to last longer than a few days or a few weeks or months but can last for a few years and get aboard that because then i don't have to relearn a stock i guess if you're day trading you know fundamentals don't matter and it's just really all technicals but i combine the two and so I, I like to get longer term moves and try to stay with with them longer or, and even trade around um, a core position and stay stay with it that way. I mean, even just like on Lily, I've been in that for uh, let's see. Uh, I've been in that for uh, all the way back, I think all the way back of June of last year, I've been in it and uh, and I've traded. I've cut back on my positions, but I've stayed stayed with it. It's bigger and slower, but it, boy, it's been a it's been a, a good mover. What am I proud of um, in my trading? I you know it's I, if if I if I feel good about one thing, it's tr is taking the market and trying to explain the market in a in a simple way, yeah. not making it so complex. When it comes down to it, all these things that I've covered today and, and just price and volume, you combine those with the earnings, but then you combine it with your life. Where are you shopping? What are you eating? What are you buying? What car do you drive? Very simple things. And just taking that puzzle and piecing it all together, trying to make it simple and, and so everybody can understand that that would be something that I feel, hey, maybe I've contributed uh, to people's knowledge and helped them out. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's that's a valuable goal. And I want to ask you, David, um, since since you mentioned you wanted to stick with the entire move, uh, what are some key principles that you you know strive to adopt when it comes to sell rules that help you you know get the most out of a position and, and allow you to stick with that trend? Well, um, uh, helping to stick with it is when a stock gets when a stock gets extended or. Uh, it's had a nice fast run up. So, it's, so Lily here coming out of the base has a has a big move up and then moves all the way up here. But but I, I you know when I start looking at the you know the, how this stock has been moving up in a channel and it's starting to get near the highs, uh, or I you know then I take it down. Well, I could take it down to a. I, I you can't see it on this, but a sixty minute chart. And seeing the stock making three moves into a high, and 
you know, and then maybe seeing the volume starting to dry up on these highs and it's starting to break, taking part of the position out, because then if I don't have my full position, then I can ride through a 20% correction or maybe, or, you know, up in here, the other thing you can do, and I just did this with Ollie in the last week, I, I sold some calls against the position. So I had, so it protected part of the position so I could stay with it longer. Um, so decreasing the position after the stock has made a great move, but not losing the position in something that I feel has probably got a lot farther to go. And how you use the, how do you use the moving averages on your chart to also help decide your, your um, you know, if you're going to keep the position or you're going to lighten up as it breaks those? Well, so, sometimes, again, this, the, the simplest rules are the best. I mean, I, when I think of NVIDIA, I mean, some of the best stocks, as long as that stock stays above its 50-day moving average. Yes, it came down to it a couple of times and went through it a little bit. But I mean, look at the volume that traded when this stock came down. There really wasn't a huge, a huge increase in, in the volume. But just staying, staying on the left side of that upward trending 50-day moving average can can keep you in in a lot of stocks and then when they get excessive then you can go down and look at that 20-day moving average how how you know a, it's hard for a stock to maintain that for for that long um but a lot of it you know uh is you know is, is studying when a stock is getting ahead of itself see you know right in here it starts going in through the climactic move those don't last long, usually three weeks. So when you start seeing that, you start looking for an exit or looking for some reversal. But so much of it is studying this over and over again, seeing these examples of the greatest winners. And, and you know, back to the beginning, you know, how they based in, in, you know, in, in the first phase, how the up move occurred, how the top moved, how they and just get those memorized in your mind and be able to recognize them as they're happening. Perfect. And given that we are, you know, in a corrective phase right now and, and we're potentially setting up for a, a huge bull market whenever it does occur, we don't know. Uh, what is your advice for everybody watching uh, that will help them basically identify the next big true market leaders that have the potential to 5x, 10x, you know, double, triple in a short amount of time? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's just recognizing the change you're really you're really an observer you're observing the characteristics the movement of these markets and it, it it's observing the characteristics starting to change and what will happen is as the market comes down you'll see that um there'll be stocks and i'll go back to you know let's go back into 2001 2000 the market comes down and usually makes three moves into a low but after you know everything comes down in one and a lot of almost all come down again make lower lows in two but as you start coming down into your third low the best performing stocks the leaders of the next cycle are, are have already made a bottom and have started to turn up and i you know I, going back i the first example i showed microsoft made its lows months and months before the rest of the market made its lows. And the same thing happened. I remember studying the 1982 low in the markets uh, that, uh, that a lot of retailers had, had, had bottomed and were turning and hitting new highs long before the, the bottom in August of 1982. So you'll see the greatest winners turn many times before, and there'll be new names where you're going to go, I don't know that stock. I have no idea what they do. That's usually going to be your big winner. It's not going to be, you know, yeah, yes, you're probably going to get a good performance out of an AMD or a Microsoft or an Apple, but you're not going to get gigantic performance because they've had huge runs and they're gigantic companies. It's going to be that one where you're going, I oh, gosh, I just don't know what they do. And you're not comfortable with that. Well, get comfortable quickly because that's probably going to be your, your, your big leader, the, the one that's already turning. Perfect. And I'd also love to ask, uh, what is kind of some of your favorite uh, William O'Neill stories or what, what are some key lessons that he passed on to you that you think are really important for newer traders to learn and, and veteran trainers to remember as well? Key stories. 
Well, I mean, it, you know, I saw, I mean, we did so many one day conferences uh, around the country for a number of years um, that, you know, he kept on, he, he was always very positive. He always said, this is the greatest country in the world. You have so much opportunity. And if you adapt the right principles to investing that you can change your life. And I think it was that positive attitude that he instilled. Um, I think it was also the worth a work ethic um, where, you know, he worked extremely hard. Um, I, I, I just, I caution that, that again, you, you want to work hard and I spend a lot of time. I spend, you know, I, sp I spend a number of hours on Sunday going through stocks, getting ready for Monday. Um, but, uh, but not to the point where it hurts what my family is doing and, and, and such there. Um, other stories, uh, <laughs> principles, uh, he was adamant that this is the can slim is the way, the only way, the fastest way to make money in the market in the shortest period of time. And if you had another theory, uh, you wouldn't, it would be, I, I would cringe sometimes after <laughs> when he would go after people that, that uh, were saying, well, how, how about this stock at the bottom? <laughs> It wasn't pleasant. Um, so that was, I would always start laughing when that would happen. Uh, but he was, he was a great guy to work for, always positive, always encouraging. And, and, you know, and he would, he would, you know, if you were doing something wrong, I, uh, you know, he would he'd tell you about it. So, uh, but just a great person to work for. And uh, I owe him, uh, owe him a lot. Perfect. And Ray wants to know, what are some of the current industry groups and areas of the market that you're watching right now that could be a source for some of those re uh, leaders going forward? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, I go to um, I go to biotechs. They haven't performed in a long time. Um, you know, they they well, they've they've come down for the last eight months or so. I see some of these starting to move some drug stocks. Now that might, you know, th they might be moving because healthcare usually does well in a, in a tough market. Um, in terms of uh, other groups, you know, that's, I really don't have a lot. I, I, oil and gas has pulled back and maybe some of these will come on again. I would be very surprised if we came too much lower uh, in, uh, in USO. I mean, it's, it, uh, you know, yes, it's had this pullback, but um, I, I just think the, the price of crude, there's still a demand that's going to come out of China when they come back online again. Um, the policies in the United States aren't good for oil and gas drilling. I don't think Biden's going to get the Saudis to, <laughs> to pump that much. And what's really interesting, too, is I guess a month ago, I guess uh, uh, Biden had... Uh, uh, executives of the oil and gas industry into into the White House and said, "Hey, you guys got to start increasing your production." Well, what's happened is it, I think one of PXD pioneers actually said the CEO said, "Well, look, we can increase our production by maybe five percent, but we don't have the refining capacity in the United States anymore. They've shut down so much refining capacity, and they're not letting us build any new refining capacity. It's going to be hard to increase that supply." So. That's why I think the price of uh, oil and gas pr will probably stay up um, for a while. And so there might be continued opportunities in that group. Perfect. And I've just got a few more questions here for you, David. Uh, first of all, once we finally do get a sustained new uptrend where you know groups are really moving together, there's a lot of stocks breaking out, the signs look good uh, for a new bull market. Um, can you describe your process for um, moving from cash uh, to fully invested, how quickly you go about it, and also your process of progressively exposing yourself to, to more and more risk as stocks start working for you and you get positive feedback from the market? Well, it's, uh, it's really you're letting the market tell you how, sh how much you should be invested. And so, you know, it starts with that first stock that starts, that starts breaking out or that has the characteristics. And, uh, and then if I start seeing another and another and another, well, then I increase my exposure. If I buy one or two stocks and they don't make much progress and I don't see a third or a fourth stock or so, then I just keep my invested position 
small. But what starts happening in a really good turn and a really good uptrend, you start seeing stocks breaking out all over the place. And then it becomes hard because then you start going, okay, well, what do I, do I buy this and this and this? And, you know, I say it all depends on the size money you have. Um, but I usually start with, you know, in this market, it would be two and a half position, uh, percent position. Then I go to five. And then if it really starts doing well, then I'll go 10%. If it's a really strong bull market, I might start at five, go to 10. And then through as the move goes on, that could become, you know, 20% or more of my portfolio. But a big position should earn a big position. You shouldn't immediately go to a big position. That's what I, that's where I got into trouble in 19. 88 I, positions were too too big off the bat and what that does it puts you puts so much pressure on you to for your timing to be so precise that it's got to go up immediately if that thing falls back two three four percent and you've got a 20 percent position that starts hurting your equity very very quickly so that's why you can't it's you know don't get that big now if you have a small amount of money if you don't have much that you've got to work with, I mean, I'm saying if you've got you know hundreds or you've got five thousand or or in, in in the tens of thousands, then you've got to bring it down to a fewer um, a fewer positions because it's it's going to be hard to make a lot of progress. When I when I really do well, I am concentrating and I'm concentrating fairly big, but it's in but the concentration has again the stocks have earned that concentration because of how of what they've done um what else uh i don't know what else was your question yeah it was just it was about you know how do you practice progressive exposure and size up and i'd love to hear you talk about you know what causes you to add to a position that's working i'd love to hear your process for pyramiding up into a, a winning position yeah well it's 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 when I, you know, I bought a stock and I got a nice position and it, it made a great move and maybe I cut back on it and then it built a whole new base. If it went sideways for five or six weeks and then it came out of there, I'm got to go back to my full position and then even buy more because it's a brand new setup. And then if it has another move again, builds a whole new base, sets up again, breaks out again, then I could e increase it even more. So, uh, and you want to do it earlier in the move and not after the stock has been running. I think too many people, they don't look at the time factor involved in the market. And I, I, I've pointed this out on um, IBD Live one day and, and even one of the panelists didn't know why this existed. If you, if you see this line right here that occurs on the, on the weekly charts, I don't think it, I, it's not, it's not going to occur on the on the uh, on the daily charts, but the reason why this line occurs, it tells you when a stock it, that's the 18 month mark, and that's usually how long a stock moves. Uh, and so, you know, some of some of the best moves when it starts getting around that point and the action of the stock starts moving differently. It's just one more piece of evidence of, okay, well, haven't you already gotten a four or five fold move out of the stock? And hasn't it already been running for 18 months or two years? It's the clock that you're running out of time. And so it's probably time to exit and look for that exit. So, um, and yeah, so the progression comes with the stock making other bases and, uh, and moving out from those bases. Perfect. And I just have uh, two more questions, David. Uh, uh, second to last, uh, we've got uh, basically, do you incorporate what the Fed is doing and what interest rates are doing at all into your process? Or really, at the end of the day, it's about the price action of the stocks yeah. and the, the groups? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm not smart enough to take all the macro picture and such. I mean, I try to figure it out or I try to, to have it uh, add to it. But when it comes down to is the reaction in the marketplace. The Fed can say everything they want, but if the reaction is different, and that's why, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I came back into Ollie again, it's, it's a stock that I've listened to every single conference call. 
And the reason why I came back into this is a few different things, is the news from Target and from Walmart saying they have so much inventory or they're going to miss their earnings because they bought wrong and they've got so much inventory and so many people. Well, who's the beneficiary of this? Well, it's, it's companies like this. I, had, I took that into factor. But then also, they came out with an earnings report that was, wasn't very good. They missed their earnings. But on the call, they said, hey, yes, we missed our earnings, but things are getting back to normal before the pandemic. And right. you pick up on things like that. And the stock trades, the stock immediately traded down when the earnings came out. But as the conference call started and, they, and I started listening to it, and they start saying positive things, that thing started turning and going higher. And that's where I first started taking a position. So a lot of it is not just the news itself, it's the reaction to news. So, and that's the other thing too, is when the market stops going down on bad news, but starts rallying, that's telling you, hey, maybe a lot of this has already worked into the market. And that's the same thing with the Fed. The Fed can raise interest rates, but everybody knows they're gonna raise interest rates. So when they raise interest rates, well, they already said it. So look for the reaction and what they say, you know, maybe they're going to say, well, we got to raise it again and again. So you look at the reaction to the news, but don't, don't, that's, you can get into trouble trying to, trying to figure out all the macro, bring it down to the individual stock and the individual index and, and groups. Keep it simple. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. David, thank you so much for your time. I just have one last question for you. Uh, what general advice do you have for everybody watching out there um, about trading, about finding success in the markets? Uh, what kind of last uh, key bits of information do you want to share with everybody? I, I think you, you, you have to keep the right perspective. Uh, trading is fascinating. I'll always keep on doing it because it, it, yeah, it's just so interesting. They're taking everything that exists out there, all the information and throwing it into a pot and mixing it up. But you have to have the right perspective. You want to study hard. You want to work hard. You want to use the right principles and, uh, and, and learn from your mistakes. Uh, but in the end, there are things that are much more important than your performance in the market. Yes, you want to do well. But are you doing well at the sacrifice of other things in your life, the people in your life? Uh, because yeah, you can have, you can have the greatest wealth in the world and be the greatest trader in the world. But if you have no family, you have no friends, it's, <laughs> it's not worth it. So keep that big perspective. I keep an eternal perspective and I use the biblical principles that I believe in to keep my head on straight and, and keep the right mental attitude. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. And I think a lot of people have gotten a lot out of this presentation. So thank you. Uh, okay. We'll be running over to lunch now for a few minutes. I'll be popping up right uh, pretty quickly for a quick message. But we'll see you guys at 1 p.m. Uh, for John Boyk, Market Historian, which I'm really looking forward to. So thanks so much. And uh, stick with us until then. Take care.